I don't know if you uh, can remember falling in love for the first time. This is certainly not the first time I'd fallen in love. I'd uh, had relationships and actually had been married uh, for a while. But I'd been single for a few years and I came down to Southern California to be a pastor at an academy high school church. And my father and mother, of course, wanted their son to be happy and began to uh, look around for people. And my father called me with a name. I, some of you have heard this maybe. And so uh, we went to meet her. I got to at least know who she was and see her one time. And then the next week, uh, there was a Christmas concert going to be at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion down in downtown Los Angeles. So I got the ad out and I got her number on the phone and I dialed her number. But before I could get any words out, I hung up, scared to death, didn't know what to say. Hadn't dated since college and uh, just scared to death. What if she didn't want me anyway? I finally got my courage and uh, called her. She said yes. She agreed to uh, have dinner over at her place first. We did that. We went to Spaghetti Factory. We began to date, go to Hollywood Bowl, go to the beach. We did many, many, many events and, of course, finally got married. And when we got married uh, at the, on the honeymoon at the hotel, I gave her a big scrapbook that I had made. I learned how to cross stitch. I made a little cross stitch. And I handed that to her, and in here was the sort of the story of our courtship. And I had the $300 phone bill that we had, I had gotten when I was gone to a meeting and uh, calling her every day, several times a day. And uh, cake we had made together, all kinds of stories and pictures, the story of our courtyard. For two plus years, I had spent thousands of dollars in flowers and dates and events and concerts and programs. In two years, I never missed one. If I said I was going to be there, I showed up. Why? I, I was in love. I was courting her and trying to get her. What do we learn about this? What does this have to say? But lots of people have done that with God and left God sitting there. God is a lover wanting to be with us. And there's times that we leave him sitting there waiting. Uh, we were in uh, Malaysia one time, all my brothers and mother, and had a night free. My brother had the movie, You've Got Mail, on the computer, so we watched that. And here's a story where Tom Hanks uh, owns a big bookstore, and he sort of drives out Meg Ryan's bookstore. At the same time, uh, they're falling in love on the Internet. So uh, he finds, I'd like to see you, you know, let's get, let's get together. And so she says, okay, I'll meet you at this restaurant. How will I know which one is you? I'll be the one with a book. And so he goes and he sends a friend in. And uh, when the friend sees who it is, he realizes who this was. It's the lady of the store that he is driving out of business. And he comes back and he tells Tom Hanks not to go in. And he leaves her sitting there at the table. And if you're watching the movie, you want to shout at him, it's Meg Ryan, it's the one you've fallen in love with on the internet. Go, go, go. He doesn't go. Now, luckily, by the end of the movie, he dies. But he leaves her sitting there. And how many people have left God sitting there when God says, I want to be with you? God is a lover. And we leave God sitting there. And I read a parable the other day about a uh, rich man who was the prince of the king. And he wanted to fall in love. And he wanted to fall in love with somebody who would love him for him, who wouldn't know that he was the king. So it's a famous parable, but he... Uh, he dressed up one time in a disguise, grew a beard, and he went to another town where he fell in love with this beautiful young lady. Well, to make a long story short, uh, it turns out that she is the daughter of the king's sworn enemy. They hate each other. These two families have been fighting for power for generations, and she hates the king, his father. And he hopes that somehow he can convince him, that the king is not like that. But she loves him and agrees to marry him and go with him to that city. And as they come over to the city, and they walk into the city and everyone is bowing to him. He's the prince, the son of the king. And finally she realizes that this one that she has fallen in love with is also the son of the king that she hates. And her view of the king is going to have to change because she's fallen in love. What do we do with God? And God is hoping that somehow 
if we have some baggage and some history with him, he is hoping that somehow we can realize, no, he isn't like that. He's just a lover. And that prince just wanted that young woman to know he is not that. He was just a lover who wanted to be with her. Different picture of God. And I'm hoping today it'll give you a different picture of what we call the Sabbath. This day when God wants to be with us. So many people have gotten the bad idea of the Sabbath. A Sabbath that is shouted in the fourth commandment, a commandment from the top of the mountain with thunder and lightning. Thou shalt not, the Sabbath of Mount Sinai, thou shalt not, thou shalt not remember the Sabbath day. But maybe we can learn about the Sabbath from another part of the Bible from the Song of Solomon. If you read in the Song of Solomon, many people can't uh, read it easily. <laughs> and they almost didn't get in the Bible, the Song of Solomon. It's so racy and so sexy as Solomon described, these two lovers described love and their bodies. Just this wonderful picture of love. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 1. All night long on my bed I looked for the one my heart loves, but did not find him. Verse 2, I will get up now and go about the city. I will search for the one my heart loves. I found the one my heart loves. I held him and would not let him go. This book is filled with love and desire and longing. And yes, it is a love story between Solomon and his lover. But Christians for thousands of years have seen it as also a picture of God and his desire for us. God is a lover who longs to be with us. It's why he created us, to be with him. It is why he made us and why he gave us a Sabbath. Could it be that God is saying to us about the Sabbath, if you can't get the Sabbath from the mountain, if you cannot uh, get in touch with the law, commandment that talks about the Sabbath, can you get the Sabbath from the Song of Solomon? I'm just a lover who comes every day, every once a week, to want to have a day to be with you. And so when he says, remember the Sabbath day, Exodus 20, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but on the seventh day you shall do no work, but rest and come and be with me. You should hear from that commandment the God of the Song of Solomon, just the God of desire and love who wants to be with us. I think God would say at the top of the mountain, why do I have to make this a commandment? If these people loved me, knew how much I loved them, I wouldn't have to make a commandment for them to come and be with me. They should just want to be with me. I've had a young couple that I've been trying to help. It doesn't look good right now. I don't know if they're going to make it or not. There have been affairs and trouble and all kinds of problems on both sides. They came to see me and we began to realize there were just some things that they had not learned. I finally said, take out some paper and just take out a pen and we're going to give you the rules. Here are the rules. You have to be faithful to each other. There's no flirting. There's no pornography. There's no one-on-one -on -one dinners with someone from the other sex. You are never alone. Whenever the other person calls you on a cell phone, you have to be able to say, here's where I am, and explain who you are right now. So you build trust. There's no lies. There's no distortions. Only openness and authenticity. These are the rules. Why should I have to make rules? These two young people stood in front of God and a preacher and gave vows to each other that were holy and sacred. Why should I have to make rules about how to love somebody? And God says, why should I have to make a commandment out of this day? I'm just a God who wants to be with you one day a week. John 17, 24, my father, my desire is that you have given me, the people that you have given to me, be with me. It's all God wants, people that Jesus has, has been given to him by the father. He wants them to be together. Jeremiah 29, 13, and 14, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. That's all God wants. Revelation 3, verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and be with them and them with me. God is a lover. Song of Solomon, lover. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. It's all God wants is a relationship. And the only reason for the Sabbath is for the relationship. Let's go back to the very beginning at the creation. When God has created man and woman in his image. Everybody knows that God created 
sex and marriage on that first Friday afternoon. He created Adam and Eve and he gave them this incredible gift. Sexuality it was not, not their idea. They didn't come up with it. God, you won't believe what we just came up with. God, let me tell you about this. No, sex and marriage and sexuality was from God. It was God's idea. And then God gave him the Sabbath. And he says, here's a day for you to rest, and I will come and be with you. I will come from where I am, and I will walk around with you, and we will be together. That's why he made Adam and Eve, was for the Sabbath. And why does everyone want one a gift, sexuality, but not the gift of the Sabbath? These two gifts that God gave, one for us to be with each other, and one for us to be with God. But everybody wants more sex, but people don't want more Sabbath. It's heartbreaking to God. Isaiah 58, 13, call the Sabbath a delight. Delight in sexuality and delight in the Sabbath. And if you look at history, when God created those days of creation, every day was more complex and more fulfilling than the day before. And so we come to animals, birds and the fish, and then animals, and then man and women, and then finally the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath was to be a day of incredible delight for God and Adam and Eve to have a day that was supposed to be beyond pleasure and greater than sex, better than sex. That's what a relationship with God was supposed to be. What has happened? What has happened when God says, come apart and be a whole day of 24 hours with me? And people say, no, no, no. We just want to go to Mass for half an hour. We want to go back to our own way. And God says, no, I want a day to be with you. Another picture of the Sabbath. Then we come down to Exodus. Israel is in uh, slavery. And now they are in Egypt and they are building buildings for Pharaoh. And uh, they're all brick makers. Brick makers. They get mad. They want to go off on the Exodus. And the Pharaoh gets mad and says, now not only are you going to build the buildings all day, but you're going to make the bricks. All day long, seven days a week. There's no vacations, there's no holidays, there's no Christmas, there's no anything. It is all the time. You ask the grandfather, what do you do? I'm a brick maker. You ask the son, what do you do? I make bricks. Everybody was a brick maker. Day in and day out, moving bricks, making bricks. I just came back from Egypt, thought about these bricks, all these step pyramids, all these various pyramids, bricks. And then God finally says to Israel, I want you to, I want you to come out. I want to take you away from slavery. I want to take you away from being in someone else's land. I'm going to give you a promised land. He takes him out to Mount Sinai. He says, I'm going to be your God. You'll be my people. And he shouts the Ten Commandments and he says, number four, remember the Sabbath day. Don't do any work. You are not just brick makers. You are not just machines working all the time, 15 hours a day, no holidays, no vacations. I'm going to give you a Sabbath. Every week on a Sabbath, We'll put away work, put away everything else, and remember that you were made to be with me. You were not made to be machines and just producing all the time, work and salary and production and freeways and commuting. No, you were made to be with me. You are not just brickmakers. That's the purpose of the Sabbath, to protest against the rest of the world. You are not just brickmakers. I think I maybe I've told uh, those of you that have watched every sermon so far about a story. I, was, I grew up in Thailand going to go again this summer, take some kids to build some things. Up in northern Thailand, a city called Chiang Mai, where we grew up, lived in a simple house. My father and mother went back with a couple of my younger brothers, who were also pastors. While they were going through the house, they got to my parents' bedroom, and my father said to my youngest brother, three of us were born here in the States, one was born there. You were conceived in this very room. My first thought was, you can't talk like that to your son. But then I realized what my father was saying to my son was this. You were not an accident. You were created in love. Your mother and I gave, gave life to you. You are my son and I am your father. I am proud to be your father. I'm proud of what you have done as a son. Never forget it. You are my son and I'm proud. Now he's gone. You know what that means to my brother to know what he meant to my father? And that's what God says to us on the Sabbath. You were not an accident. You were made in love. You were made in my image to be with us, to be with me. I was going to come down and be with you. Better than sex, better than marriage, better than highest pleasures you have in the world is to be with God, 
That's what the Sabbath is for. You're not a brick maker. You're not a machine. The Sabbath is a protest. That we will not, we will not give in to the culture around us that says you are what you produce. You are the degrees after your name. You are how much money you make. You are your house, your car. You are not just a person on the freeway. On a Sabbath, we take away the commute. We don't go to work. We don't go to the malls. We put away video games. We put away cell phones. We put away computers. We put away the clock. And we just spend a day to be with God. You're not a brick maker. You're not a machine. You are a day to be with That's who you are. Your self-esteem will not come from what you produce, but from your relationship with God. That's the Sabbath. Finally, the Sabbath is a day to be with Christ. People sometimes think God of the Old Testament is the God, the Father, the law-giving God, the judge God, the God who shouts from the top of the mountain. No, that God is the same as Jesus. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. My Father and I are one. The God of creation is Jesus. The God of the Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath is Jesus. It is all Jesus. It is a day to be with Jesus. And Jesus says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. John says in Revelation 1, verse 10, what is the Lord's day? Jesus says in Matthew 12, the Sabbath is the Lord's day. The Sabbath, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. It is for us, but yes, it is His day. The Sabbath is Jesus' day. If you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus, then it is a day to be with the Sabbath. It's a day to be with Jesus. It is always focused on Christ. It is Jesus who says <clears throat> in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all you are weary, heavy laden. I will give you rest. And on the Sabbath, we put away all the work and we come to Jesus. And he gives us rest. It is a day to be with Christ. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. I wrote a parable about this years ago. I was speaking to college kids about a young man. He was a nothing, an average young man. But he had his eyes set on this beautiful girl in the campus. She was the cheerleader. She was the best, the most beautiful, good Christian, alive, incredible. It came time for the prom, and she wrote a note to him. She said, I'd like you to go with me. Me? You can't mean me. No, I want, I want to go with you. He says, I don't have a car. I live out of town, 50 kilometers. I cannot come. She said, the next day, her father owned a car dealership, and he gave, he gave this young man a Jaguar, his own car. Oh, he loved that car. He raced all around with all his friends with his new car. One day, he was racing around with all his friends showing off the car when he realized, tonight was the prom. I'm supposed to go. He raced home, got a shower, raced 50 kilometers all the way into town. Went to her house, she was gone. Went to the gymnasium where the auditorium where the dance was going to be. He looked in the window and here she was dancing with his best friend. Oh, how could he have forgotten? The car was so that he could be with, the car was fun in and of itself. It's fun to have a day off on the Sabbath and to just be by yourself. Don't have to work and just play. But the purpose of the Sabbath was to be with Christ. The purpose of that car was to be with him, with the girl. Years later, he went to college. They came out of college. He got an invitation to come to the wedding. And he went to the wedding. She married his best friend. So happy together, he got in line. <laughs> and finally got right in front of her. When she realized who it was, she bent down and kissed him. And then she whispered in his ear, it was supposed to be you. Jesus wants to be with us. The Sabbath is the car, the Jaguar, to be with him. It's a day of delight, a day of pleasure to be with Jesus. It's a part of being a Christian. Revelation 14, 4 says the final group of people will follow the Lamb wherever he goes, and we follow the Sabbath. It's supposed to be a taste of heaven. The Sabbath is not only a memorial of the past, because heaven is going to be a recreation of the original creation, the Sabbath is also a taste of what heaven will be which is why on the Sabbath we don't work, because heaven we won't work. On Sabbath we hang out with the people that we love the most, because in heaven we will finally be back with my Father, and all the people that we have laid to rest, we will be with them. We will. That's why we do that on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath we take no time, because in heaven there will be no sense of time going by. In Sabbath they'll be filled with pleasure and delight, because heaven will be the best we could ever imagine. That's the purpose of the Sabbath. 
Heaven begins now. We don't wait for heaven to begin. The Bible, the kingdom of God begins now. We're already the stone we've talked about. We're in the stone. We're already beginning the best of heaven today. We don't wait for Jesus to come, and when we die, we'll finally go to heaven. Today, we live a godly life that is filled with the very best. Jesus says, I came to give you life, and life more what? Abundantly. The Sabbath is a taste of that. Hebrews 6 says, we taste now of the joy of the ages to come. I watched a few um, James Bond movies, 007. In every movie, the few that I've watched, there's always a disaster, some crisis, and they call for James Bond, and he gets into a battle with all the evil people, and finally there's a final solution, and he wins over everybody, and then there's a moment where he is out in the ocean in the boat, usually with a beautiful girl, or in a balloon, or he is someplace with a beautiful girl, and there is peace everywhere, the bad guys are all gone. And the good guys have won. It's like that in the great controversy. We have this battle going on between good and evil. And Jesus Christ came down and he won the victory. And then there's a moment of peace. The Sabbath is that moment of peace. All week long we've had the battle between good and evil. And we're at work and we're fighting a battle all the time. But there comes this moment when we take the Sabbath and all the battle goes away. And we celebrate Jesus who has won the victory for us all. And we have peace. Sunday, the battle begins again. And there's another James Bond movie they have to make. It was all over, and now the bad guys are back. Every week, the bad guys come back on Sunday, and we fight the battle for another week. And then on Sabbath, we have another moment of peace as a taste of what the heaven will be someday. Sabbath is a taste of heaven. Well, you may have a few questions about the Sabbath. Do you have to keep the Sabbath to be saved? The Bible is very clear. We're saved through Jesus alone. But he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. We do both. In the sanctuary, in the most holy place, there is the mercy seat and the Ten Commandments. We do both. Jesus, grace, and the Sabbath. You cannot keep the Sabbath and be a legalist. The Bible is clear that you keep the Sabbath as a sign that you are trusting in Jesus. Hebrews 4 says there's a Sabbath rest for you. You rest from trying to save yourself. We rest in Jesus and we rest on the Sabbath. Shabbat, the rest. I thought the Sabbath was only for Jews. Only for Jews. No, the Bible is very clear. The Sabbath is for everybody. The Sabbath was thousands of years before there were any Jews. At creation, it is part of life. You live, you're human. It's the day to be with God. God is a lover. He comes down to be with us. He's the song of Solomon who every day waits, every Sabbath waits to be with us. Or are you going to leave him sitting there? It's not just for Jews. Isaiah 56 says, My house is a house of prayer for all people. Let those who are foreigners not feel that they are apart, not feel that they cannot be part of the people of God. May they come and be with me. The Sabbath is for everybody. What is it okay to do on the Sabbath? Whatever is with God. Whatever helps you be with God. Isaiah 58, call the Sabbath a delight. To be with God and to be with the people that you love most. Whatever does that and gives you life more abundantly, that's the Sabbath. Does it really matter? Does it really matter? We all know that somewhere along the line, the Sabbath got changed. It's a fact of history. Two or three hundred years after Christ, people began to keep another day in honor of the Son, in honor of the resurrection. And finally, the Constantine made a law. The Catholic Church made a law. That's a fact of history. There's no question about it. The question is, does it matter? Does God really care as long as you spend some time with Him? Does it really matter? And we would like to say that the Bible says in Ezekiel 20 and Exodus 31, the Sabbath is a sign that you belong to God. God made it holy. We want to be very careful about changing something that God himself made holy and wrote with his finger on stone. I've used the illustration all over the world. I take flags and take some rags. I'll take flags from, rags from that country, red, white, and blue, whatever it is, and I'll say, you can take these rags and you can wash your car with it. You can wipe your shoes. You can put it on a doorstep to walk in. But you take those same rags and you, you make a flag out of it and I hold the flag up. Now you cannot wash the car anymore. You cannot wash your shoes. This is holy and sacred. People have died for that flag. 
That's what the Sabbath is. It's holy. It's a sign that you are belong to God, that you are trusting in God to save you. It is a sign that you are being saved by grace alone. You have the Olympics. They finish a race, and they come around at the end of the race, and whoever wins goes over to the side and gets a flag and goes running with the flag around the track. No one knows beforehand whose flag is going to, who's going to win. So everybody has to have a flag there, seven, eight flags. And when someone runs around, they don't just grab any flag, the first one, and go running. No, they always grab their country's flag because they, they've trained for that country's flag. We think it matters. Isaiah, I mean, Daniel chapter 5, Daniel had to walk in and explain the handwriting on the wall. And first he said to uh, in Babylon and all Belshazzar and all those, they were drinking from the golden goblets. Those were holy goblets that were in the temple in Jerusalem. He said, how can you drink out of these holy things? They were holy to God. You cannot come now and drink in those things in Babylon. Once God makes something holy, be very careful. My sons, I come back from overseas and I come off the plane in Los Angeles and I go through customs, get my suitcases, and I come around the corner. I expect my sons to be there. If my wife has some trouble with my sons, she can't uh, trade them in for someone else. And I walk around, and here's some other sons. No, when I come back from a trip, the very same sons that my wife and I created years ago have to be there. When God comes back from thousands of years, when he comes back on the cloud, I think he's going to want to know that those of us that he created and the Sabbath that he created is still the same Sabbath. It's holy. It's sacred. We think it honors God most if you will honor God on the very day that he set aside, on the very day that he wrote with his own finger. It is a day to be with God, the God of Son of Solomon. Don't miss it. Don't leave him sitting there. God bless you.